Welcome to another episode of Game of Thrones Abridged on Alt Swift X. Today we are reading Tyrion V, A Game of Thrones, uh, also known as Westerosi Criminal Justice and the pitfalls thereof. This is an examination of the legal system in all its intricacies. Because so, the Westerosi, they don't have time for lawyers, they don't have time for paperwork, they don't have time for bureaucracy, they take justice down to what it should be. Uh, uh, an entirely asymmetrical uh, and opaque system whereby those in power maintain their power by threatening violence against the small. That's, these are the good old days of, of law. Back when men were men, dwarfs were dwarfs, and and the disenfranchised mi minorities were, were, were disenfranchised. The good old days of Westeros. That is what this chapter is about. So it begins with a wonderful line. You want to eat? The jailer Maud. Everyone's favourite character, Maud, is, is, is brandishing beans at Tyrion Lannister. Uh, he is offering food to Tyrion, who is in a cell, a sky cell, in the eerie, iry, airy. I still can't decide. Uh, and Lannister is... Tyrion is starving. He's very hungry. But he won't make this jailer... He won't, he won't let this jailer make him beg. Because even in a difficult situation, Tyrion is a Lannister through and through, and he is p too proud to let the jailer see him squirm. Tywin, Tyrion, Tyrion, really is a Lannister. Uh, and so Tyrion uh, gets all uppity and sarcastic, and, um, and George manages to sneak in a food description of Tyrion describing what he'd like to eat with fresh baked bread and peas and onions and so on and so forth. It goes on for several pages. Uh, no, it, no, it doesn't. Uh, and, and then, and then Maud, Maud, uh, Maud strikes back with a witticism of his own by saying, "Is beans here?" I actually, I think, I think Maud and Tyrion have a great sort of comic sort of counterpoint. Like they're they're a great comedic duo because Tyrion has all the words, whereas Maud, Maud is more concise. You know, staccato. It, it, it it's a beautiful melody of, of of Tyrion's chirpy little flute and then Maud's simple. Simple, sparse drum beats. I'm going to do an Anthony Fantano music review of this Game of Thrones chapter. It's going to be amazing. I'm feeling a light, a light seven on this one. Fuck, this is, this is the future of entertainment. Music reviews of books. The possibilities are endless. But we do have a chapter to read. Uh, so, Maud is described. Maud is ugly with rotting teeth and small dark eyes. He's missing part of his cheek and ear where an axe had cut it off. How did that happen? I want to know Maud's backstory. What adventures or misadventures did Maud go through that led to the loss of his ear? Did it involve beans? That might explain Maud's, Maud's insistence on beans in this chapter. Was was some terrible bean-related incident responsible for the, for the for the damage to Maud's beautiful face? He could have had a career as a model. He had everything going for him before it was cruelly taken away in a freak, bean accident. Like in Zoolander, it could have happened to anyone. Beans more dangerous than you know. Uh, public service announcement, but then, but then Maud is dangling the beans above Tyrion and going, big like the little chihuahua pup you are, um, and Tyrion, Tyrion, Tyrion makes a grab for the beans, and then, and then Maud jerks it away, which is like Tantalus, another bloody, another bloody Greek, the Greeks are coming up in every chapter, aren't they, Greeks, the Greeks, they, 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 they did some stuff, didn't they? They wrote some, some things. Tantalus is the name of the guy. Tantalus was this guy who was, who, his punishment in the underworld was that he, I don't know what he did. They, they never tell you what these guys, do. well, sometimes they do, but, but the point was this guy was being punished for some terrible crime, possibly a bean-related crime. Uh, we don't know. But Tantalus had to stand in a pool for eternity, uh, and he was 
desperately thirsty. And and every time he'd reach down to to drink from the water he was standing in, the water line would recede down into the ground so he couldn't he couldn't grab any of the water, or alternatively, the, the water would slip between his fingers as he tried to bring it to his mouth, so he couldn't drink, and he was also starving, he was ravenously hungry for, for eternity, for centuries and centuries, and, uh, but over his head, there were, there were these fruit trees with all these delicious pomegranates and, and, and such, what kind of fr- fruits do Greeks like? The most delicious fruits you can imagine, like, these are like, these these are the stuff that Fruit Loops are made of, and they're dangling above. And Tantalus reaches, but every time he reaches for the fruit, some infernal hellish wind, just just gently, uh, uh, not a a breeze, a gentle, a hellish breeze. Hellish breeze is a good name for a metal band, and a hellish breeze gently lofts 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 the little the the fruits on the tree. Out, just out of Tantalus's grasp, and 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 the reason why it's so cruel, is that the thing that he desperately needs, is so close forever, and he can never reach it. It's like this ultimate terrible torture. And that's where we have the word tantalize. That's where that comes from, and that is what's being reenacted now in Game of Thrones with Tyrion and Maud and the bowl of beans. Now you know. Uh, And so, and so, uh, Maud is a cunt, uh, and Maud dangles the beans for Tyrion, but he dangles it over the edge of the cell, because of course this is a sky cell in the Eyrie, and the way these work is that they're, the one of the walls is missing. There is no fourth wall. The fourth wall can't be broken because it is not there, and beyond that wall is a void, because they're at the top of the Eyrie, this this, the castle on a mountaintop, and and, and the cell opens out into the void, and below is a huge drop. And if you were to fall, you would become a sickening red splotch on the stones of Sky. Sky being one of the way castles, uh, I wonder how often they have people land on their roof. It must be a nightmare to to clean. Do you think it's someone's job in the Skyway Castle to get a mop and a bucket and just to scrape the remains of whoever had most recently pissed off Lysa Aaron off the roof? That has to be someone's job, or else it'll attract shadow cats. Do you want ants? Because that's how you get ants. See the fucking references. I'm on fire. Uh, anyway. So, uh, Maud is grunting and he's opening his thick fingers and being basically the most loathful fucking quaternary character in this, well, this chapter. There's a lot of awful minor characters. And then, and then Maud lets the beans go, go off the void. He drops Tyrion's dinner off the edge into the nothingness. Uh, and Tyrion feels a pang of rage, which he expresses by saying, you fucking son of a pox-ridden ass." And that's from a pang of rage. I wonder what Tyrion would say if he felt a full-blown wave of rage, a tsunami of, of chutzpah, not chutzpah. What's the other term for rage that's uh, r- rage, anger, fury, a s- fury storm. If, if he had one of those, what would he say? I, I imagine it would, it couldn't get much more colourful. But he hopes that Maud will die of a bloody flux. And Maud kicks him. And then Tyrion says, No, I'll kill you myself, I swear it. Which is like, damn, son. Like, Tyrion, Tyrion in this, in these early books is very sort of angry and spiteful and vindictive. I mean, you know, fair enough, he is being very poorly treated, but still, he's got a lot of hate in his tiny little body. And I think more so than in the later books, though admittedly in the later books he's much more comfortable than right now, so perhaps that explains it. Um, And then when Maud leaves, Tyrion reflects on how his mouth, his dangerously big mouth on on his rather small body, uh, has gotten in, him into a lot of trouble. Uh, and he thinks about the shadow skin cloak that he used to have, that he gambled off Marillion, uh, and he thinks about, he thinks about the horrors of the Sky Cell. So the, so the Sky Cell, the, the drop, 
out of his cell is apparently 600 feet, uh, which for the metrically inclined is, uh, that'd be like 200 meters or something, I think. Uh, and, and so the way this is described, like all the sky cells are sort of dotted on like the sheer face of the eerie. Uh, and the way this is described is that Tyrion is a bee in a stone honeycomb and someone had torn off his wings. Stone Honeycomb is also a good name for a band, I think. Uh, you can have that one for free. Uh, and then Tyrion reflects that the, the sky cell, the way it's designed, is that the floor slopes downwards towards the void. So you can go to sleep, but if you were to roll in your sleep, or to slip, or to slide, you might find yourself flying into the sky and downwards to become a sickening red splotch. So this is a quite an ingenious torture device is what this cell is. It drives men mad apparently. There's, someone has written on the wall in blood, a previous prisoner, the blue is calling. So, 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 so this cell is so unpleasant that it literally drives people insane and makes them tortured by the notion of giving themselves to the void and the emptiness. What did Freud call it? The, the kill drive, the death drive or something. I mean, it all comes down to fucking and death with Freud, but, the, but it's, th this cell is very much representative of that drive to die. Freud reckons that there's part of our little brain hole that, is, that wants to die. Or to kill, or it seems all sort of mushed together in Freud's head. He was a funny little puppy. Um, but anyway, so there's an unplug. George Martin re spends a lot of time. I think I think one of George Martin's fascinations is human suffering and the very varied and ingenious ways to uh, to cause it and experience it, especially some of his. Um, some of his weird sci-fi short stories, which y'all should read, uh, a lot of them are all these bizarre fucking sci-fi things ab about these even more imaginative ways to suffer. There's, like, people who have all of their limbs cut off and they turn into worm people, and there's psychic people doing all sorts of... and there's corpses walking... Really gross, strange, dark things happening, coming from the mind of George Martin, and this is a very vanilla example of his penchant for suffering. He has that in common with the Greeks, I suppose. Uh, and so, uh, so then Tyrion has a little flashback. He goes back into the past and, rem and uh, remembers what happened that got him into this cell. The meeting he had with Lady Lysa in the Hall of the Eerie uh, earlier. And he remembers the wretched boy, uh, Robert Aaron, the sickly six-year-old. Um, and, and he sits upon a throne of carved weirwood, does the young Lord of the Eerie, and no doubt, no doubt Preston Jacobs would tell you that that is a, that is a, a, a psychic, a psychic antennae that, that connects to, to Blood Raven's eye hole, where it beams messages about the glass candles and the spaceship that is the Red Comet heading towards Planetos. That's prop. That 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 might be Preston's hypothesis. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, but so Lady Lysa is there, and uh, and the Lord of the Eerie is making fun of how little Tyrion is, which is <laughs> funny coming from a from a rather little pot himself to be calling that kettle dwarfy. Um, and then and then Lysa says, "Oh, this is Tyrion who murdered John Arryn. Oh, look at him, the murderer of John Arryn. Oh." Of course, she is the murderer of John Aaron. Lysa is trying to cover her ass here. Um, and Tyrion's like, wait, 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 hold on a minute. You're saying that I killed John Aaron? I thought I was here because I supposedly killed John, uh, I supposedly killed Bran Stark. I didn't fucking try to kill either of those pricks. What, what do you want from me, world? Uh, Tyrion has been accused of two murders that, that he had nothing to do with. Um... And uh, Tyrion, in reflection, realises that he probably should have kept his mouth shut through all this. But basically, Tyrion does not shut up. He's really mad, and he's angry, and he feels humiliated and uncomfortable. So he gets really sarcastic and mouthy, basically, in front of the Lord of the Vale and, and, and his protectoress. Um, 
A half-sane weakling son is the description of Robert Aaron. How is he still alive? Jesus Christ. Um, and, uh, Lysa's like, you better fucking not speak with your mouth hole, and Tyrion's like, that's literally the only power I have in this situation, so I'm gonna. Um, and, and Tyrion's like, man, my brother, my big brother Jamie, he's gonna come save me, and it's gonna be great, and you're gonna have pie on your face, except you won't have pie on your face, because you won't have a face, because my brother Jamie's gonna cut it off and bake it into a pie so maybe he'll put the face back onto your face in the form of a pie so you will have pie on your face and also lack a face that's the ingenious greek style punishment that Tyrion devises for lysa uh that that's sort of what he says uh, and, and Lysa's like, you better swallow the next threat, don't you talk mouth to me, mister, I am a tut-tut. Uh, Lysa waves her finger at Tyrion. Uh, and then Robert has a little spaz attack, uh, and he says, well, you can't hurt us, we're safe here, well, you, you can never hurt us, the eerie is impregnable, you can't hurt me. R- Robert, Robert seems to have a lot of fear of hostility. I wonder if it's his mother's whisperings that has made him so obsessed with safety from outside forces, or if Robert has had some experience of harm from outside, or if he purely imagines it, or if indeed the, the, the Red Comet spaceship is broadcasting uh, the the perils of the Deep Ones into John Aaron's psychic head. That's also a hypothesis. Uh, and, and then they, and then they keep talking about how, ooh, the, the, it would be very hard to invade the Eerie. The Eerie has never been taken. It's so well defended. The Eerie is impregnable. And there's no fucking way on earth that you say this many times that the Eerie is impregnable and not have the Eerie taken at some point in this story. That's, honestly, I think that's one of the most certain, (laughs) Uh, uh, future events that will happen in this series is the Eerie being taken, presumably by Danny with dragons, because it's ridiculous how many times we're told that it will never happen. The Titanic will never sink. That was the death knell. If 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 they called the Titanic the ship that will surely sink, it wouldn't have sunk because God is. That's how he operates. He's a contrarian. He just likes to prove people wrong. You know, you say that things things orbit around the Earth. That may, he'll prove you wrong. God, God's God just just loves to tell people they're wrong. I want to eat this apple. Fruit's good for fruit's good for my bones. Wrong. Out of the Eden Garden. That's how he operates. Anyway, uh, so Tyrion keeps talking because uh, that's what he does, uh, and then and then. They threaten to kill Tyrion, and Catelyn's like, maybe that's not a great idea. Uh, and then Tyrion falls over, and everyone laughs at Tyrion because uh, the struggles of cripples are uh, great. Uh, and Servardus, doomed Servardus, takes him down to the dungeon. And so that's the end of Tyrion's flashback. Uh, so basically Tyrion just talked his way into a cell because he was being overly aggressive. Although, of course, Lysa probably wouldn't have listened to reason, re- reason anyway, so whatever. But he says, oh, I will remember this. So he's continuing to be very vindictive and threatening and hostile. He's very hostile. Admittedly, he is in a very hostile environment. But should you meet hosti- hostility with hostility? That's not what our good friend Jebediah would have said, I don't think. Uh, but then again, God is a contrarian. Uh, and so Tyrion now in his cell is trying to reassure himself that he won't come to harm. Uh, he's like, well, surely Catelyn and Lysa won't kill me. Well, no, he thinks Lysa won't kill me, because uh, to kill me would mean war, and there's no way Lysa would be that crazy. Uh, I think he's assuming that Lysa is more of a rational actor than she actually is. And Lysa, right now, doesn't have Littlefinger's direct guidance, uh preventing any true insanity from happening. So yeah, I would not assume that Lysa's gonna 
be sensible. Uh, and Tyrion thinks about how uh, he is uh, weak and he's he, he's being starved and he's being exposed in the cold and he feels the blue might start calling to him too, so there are worries about Tyrion's life happening here. He thinks about his family coming out to get him. He thinks, well, surely Lord Tywin will come and save me. Surely Jaime will come and save me. Surely Cersei could whisper into the king's ear to help me. Um, and it's interesting that he does assume that Cersei would indeed advocate for him to Robert. He assumes that Cersei would help Tyrion. Of course, in the later books, uh, Cersei tries very hard to kill Tyrion. Uh, so relations between Cersei and Tyrion w- were apparently significantly better uh, earlier in the series, though, uh, yeah, later on they could hardly get worse. Uh, and then he also reflects on his actual sort of situation, these accusations, and he reflects that the Starks actually have zero proof that he did anything wrong, because, of course, he didn't try to kill Bran or kill John Aaron. Uh, so he feels like that's <laughs> that's got to count for something, his innocence. Yeah, he thinks about the personality of Cersei, how she is not without a certain cunning, uh, but that her pride blinds her, which is an accusation that could well be leveled at Tyrion for some of the things that he's done in this chapter as well. I swear to God, people accuse others of the faults that they recognise in themselves. That's... That's Peppa Pig taught me that. <clears throat> uh, and he thinks about the nature of Jamie, that Jamie is rash and quick to anger, and that he never unties a knot when he could slash it with his sword, which I think is a lovely line. Uh, and, he, and, and he also reflects for a moment, I wonder who actually did try to kill Bran? Was it Jamie? Was it Tyrion? Uh, and were Jamie uh, was or Cersei and was Jamie and Cersei were they responsible for the death of John Aaron? Um, Tyrion definitely doesn't put it past uh, his siblings to try to kill some people, and he thinks that well, you know, the 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 death of John Aaron was quite well executed, you know, poisoning this old man. In, on the other hand, the attempted murder of Bran Stark was unbelievably clumsy, in Tyrion's words. And of course, the, these do reflect the 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 relative schemery of the actual perpetrators of those respective crimes. Because of course, Littlefinger is a clever little bugger who is quite good at killing people, whereas uh, yeah, little little Joffrey, Cersei's spawn, Joffrey is not so adept a murderer. Thankfully, imagine if Joffrey was competent. That would be truly horrifying. An evil person who's competent. Evil's a strong word. And then Tyrion thinks, wait, hold on a minute, maybe it was someone else. Maybe it wasn't my siblings. Maybe the dire wolf and the lion are not the only beasts in the woods. There are rather a lot of beasts in the woods, actually. There are many political players, but the ones most relevant here are Littlefinger and people like Varys. Littlefinger being the pertinent one. Uh, and Tyrion thinks, man, I do not like being a pawn in the games of other power players, which indeed he is right now in Littlefinger's machinations. And then Tyrion decides, all right, I've got to do something about this situation. I've got to get out of this fucking cell before I freeze to death. So he decides that he'll talk his way out. He talked his way in, so surely he can talk his way out. So then he bangs on the door of his cell and he shouts for 10 minutes, which is a rather a long time to shout, I think. Uh, but he shouts for ten minutes, and then eventually Maud comes out with a leather strap and hits him. But Tyrion, Tyrion, uh, Tyrion thinks, "Never show them you're afraid." Tyrion reminds himself, which strikes me as a Tywinism. That, that uh, surely that's something that Tywin taught Tyrion: never show that you're afraid, because Tywin, of course, uh, hates to betray any emotion or insecurity. Tywin likes to have this facade of. St- strength and pride and I don't have feelings, I'm a lion of the rock. My dead wife? I'll never betray any emotion about that. I'll honour her memory by never referring to her ever. Tywin's a sad boy. Uh, and then, and then Tywin makes a pitch. Tywin, uh, sorry, Tyrion makes a makes an elevator pitch to Maud. He tries to get him on side with a quick, concise spiel, is what, it was what Tyrion did, and he, and he starts it Starts it with, "How would you like to be rich?" He's he's like he's like Trump trying to trying to advertise for his Trump Academy. Remember that he goes, "How would you like to be rich, like me? How would you wear like to wear a tie made of made of golden hookers wrapped in a cocaine?" 
is <laughs> I, I don't think there's there's singular cocaine. But anyway, Maud decides to hit him. That's his response to the elevator pitch at first. Um, but but Tyrion's like, no, but Casterly Rock is full of gold, as rich as the la- as rich as the Trumps. Trump Tower is full of gold. You can trust me, cause I'm rich. I'm a, that makes me an authority figure. I'm wise if I'm rich, because the capitalist system proves me thus. And then Maud hits him again. Uh, Maud, Maud, Maud is um is pretty consistent in his response. I mean, Maud, Maud has faults. You know, Maud's not a perfect man, but he at least has his consistency. If he faces something he doesn't like or understand, he hits it. When in doubt, hit it. You know. He's, 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 he's reliable, Maud is. Uh, and Tyrion's getting fairly seriously injured by this beating. His mouth is full of blood, uh, and he, and he gets sort of briefly knocked out at one point and lands right near the edge of the sky cellar, which is fucking terrifying. Um, but Tyrion's like, come on, I, I, you can be rich if you listen to me, I'm gonna help you out. Uh, and, um, and Tyrion thinks to himself, I could make good use of a strong man like you. Uh, which again is another thing that Tywin would say. I think Tywin talks about men being tools to be used for a job, and and Tyrion is here thinking of men as tools. And 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 Tyrion's like, oh, you gonna you gonna I'm gonna make you rich. I'm, you can buy land and women and horses. You could be a lord, Lord Maud, House Maud of of the Sky Cell. Wouldn't that be great? I'd love to see Lord Maud as a lord. Uh, I wouldn't want to be under him though. Uh, and, and eventually Maud <laughs> wears down and starts listening, uh, and, um, and, and Tyrion's like, okay, here, here's the deal. You deliver a message to Lady Lysa, and I'll, I'll turn you into a 25-carat goldman living in a water slide of molten gold, but the cooled kind of molten gold, so it's comfortable. Uh, and, uh, and then, and then from, and, and Maud is slowly being convinced, and suspicion and greed war in his eyes, because of course George Martin is all about the human heart in conflict, and in this moment Maud's heart is in conflict with itself. Literature, art, the beauty of the word. That's what we get in this chapter. Uh, and then, and then, ba- basically, it 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 happens. Uh, Maud agrees. Uh, he fingers his strap. Got to give the strap a good fingering sometimes. Um, there's more talk of gold, and eventually, uh, Tyrion succeeds, and uh, and Vardis Egan, the captain of guard, turns up and pulls Tyrion out of the cell and drags him in front of Lysa. Uh, uh, and Tyrion actually has a history with Vardis Egan because he was he was in King's Landing guarding John Arryn for for the years that John Arryn was hanged. Uh, and Tyrion gets his cloak back, his shadow skin cloak, and he and he's feeling nice and snug. A snug dwarf is the best kind of dwarf. Uh, and, uh, and so he is taken before Lady Lysa in the Grand Hall, and he looks around to observe what other people are in attendance, uh, the other people he needs to look out for. He sees Brynden Tully is in attendance. I wonder what he makes of this scene. Uh, and Nestor Royce is there, and Lynn Corbray is there, the Wainwoods and Lord Hunter is there, and basically all the important people in the Vale are here. Um... And Roderick Cassell is here, recovering from his wounds. And Marillion, the singer, is there. And Marillion has a broken hand, because Tyrion fucking stomped on it. Tyrion was such a cunt to Marillion. Uh, and, and Bronn is also there. And Tyrion gives Bronn a long look, wondering, could this be an ally? Uh, and, and Catelyn Stark is there, and she's like, okay, what, you're here to confess your crimes? confess your crimes. And then Tyrion gives this speech. And this is a speech that is actually considerably better in the show, I think. It's, it's, I mean, it's at least much funnier in the show. But basically what Tyrion does is he's like, oh yes, I'm a wretched little gremlin boy. Uh, wretched little gremlin and my crimes are too long to list. Uh, my naughty list is longer than my, my, my good list. I've got an only call from Santa Claus because I'm a wicked, wicked little boy Boy, man, is what I am. Uh, I've whored. I've said rude words. Uh, I've done stinky farts. I've done every, every terrible, terrible wrong thing that's ever been done. 
and the no, and everyone in the court laughs at what he says, even though in the book it's actually not very funny what he says. But that's what I love about writing a story is that you can just say that that everyone laughs at the hilarious thing you just wrote, even if what you just wrote isn't all that hilarious. But the reader who's not paying attention might well think, yeah, that was hilarious, even though it's not. It's it. Well, it's. I mean, it's not. It's not super funny in the show, but he talks about wanking into soup, and I think that gets. You know, I mean, uh, uh, the, the the classic wank soup joke. It's like a knock-knock joke, you know? It's one of those time-tested forms of comedy. The, 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 the wank soup. Who, what, 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 name a comedian today, a stand-up comedian, who doesn't at least have a 12-minute bit on wank soup. Wank soup is, is, is the cutting edge of comic styling right now. Anyway... So, um, so then Tyrion does these things saying, oh, 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 I'm such an awful man, I did all. And then he says, oh, but killing John Aaron and assassinating Bran, I actually have nothing to fucking do with that, you pricks. And then, and then Lysa's like, alright, chuck him back in the cell, we'll fucking bleed him out, fuck him. And then Tyrion goes, are you fucking kidding me? Is this how justice is done in the Vale? He says, this is not how justice works, you can't say that I did something. And I say I didn't do it, and then you have no evidence, and then you fucking torture me in a cell until I say I did it. Like, who am I? Fucking Julian Assange. This is bullshit. Julian Assange wasn't tortured. Uh, but then, uh, so Tyrion's like, I demand a trial. And so then Lysa's like, well, if you fail the trial, this is what happens. And she opens up the moon gate, which is this portal into the void. Something that H.P. Lovecraft... If H.P. Lovecraft wrote it, there'd be tentacles on it or something. And it would drive men mad and it would have sea creature undertones. Uh, but it's a weirwood door, by the way, which is interesting, the moon door. But it's a void. It's, it just opens up into a void. In the show, it, it's, it opens up in the floor and it goes directly downwards, which I think is cooler if less architecturally plausible. Uh, whereas in the books, it op- it, it's, it's a side wall and you have to get shoved out horizontally before you can fall, which is, you know, less good, I think. Anyway, so then Lysa's like, all right, here's how the trial's going to be hap- going to be done. My six-year-old insane, stupid child who hates you uh, will listen to your story and decide whether you're correct or not. And then Tyrion's like, shit, that's not going to work, is it? Um, so he decides that his only opportunity, his only option is to demand trial by combat. And then everyone laughs at him again. They laugh until tears run down their faces, which again seems an overreaction to a not very funny situation, but, you know, the 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 people of the Vale, they love to laugh. They're a good spirited people here, and they like to have a little chuckle out their little giggle holes. That's what they like to do. A mirthful folk are the Valemen. Uh, and, uh, and so they have a giggle, uh, and then all all these people say, like, all right, so who's going to fight for the side of Lysa Aaron? And all these knights and lords come out. Even Lord Hunter, old Lord Hunter, offers to fight for Lysa. And he has quite bad gout, I believe. Um, I, I, honestly, I think Tyrion could probably beat old Lord Hunter because he's elderly, practically infirm, and as far as we know, not particularly good at fighting. He actually gets killed by his children later on in the story, I believe. But anyway, all these cunts offered a fight, including Lynn Corbray. It'd be a fucking worry if you had to go up against Lynn Corbray. I don't think even Bronn could beat Lynn Corbray with his Valyrian steel blade, Lady Forlorn, but whatever. Uh, and in the end, uh, oh yeah, and then Tyrion starts to think, wow, quite a lot of random people are enthusiastic about murdering me, um, which, you know, it would ruin anyone's day. Um, and, uh, eventually Vardis Egan. It's decided that Vardis Egan would be the champion of Lysa. And he's like, well, do I have to kill this dwarf? I mean, that would be icky. I don't want dwarf blood on my trousers. That's not, that's, that, I don't want to kill him. And then Tyrion says, yes, I agree with that sentiment. Don't kill Tyrion. Uh, I, I would like to have a champion to fight your champion. I would like uh, Jamie Lannister to fight for me. And then Lysa's like, well, you can't have Jamie Lannister because he's on the other side of the continent. Fuck you. So are you going to fight yourself, little dwarf man, or have you got a champion? And then there's silence for a while until finally Bronn speaks up and says, I'll stand for the dwarf. Which, again, I think is better in the show, because Bronn has a great sort of shrug 
in the show as though sort of like, yeah, all right, why not? I'll, I'll, I'll engage in a fight to the death for the honor of a rich dwarf, you know? I haven't, I haven't got anything better to do. I had no plans for the weekend. I might as well, you know, have a little skirmish for a, for a bucket of gold, you know? A bucket of dwarf, bucket of gold. That's how I roll, you know? That's, that's my flavor. I'm brawn, you know? I'm laid back. I'm a laid back murderer. I'm a relaxed killer. That's that's how I do. That's brawn. So thank you for listening to this episode of Game of Thrones Abridged on Alt Swift X. I hope you enjoyed and I hope you will enjoy all your pursuits in the future. Uh, cheers. <laughs>